It's what you would call the boredom. What's your name, big fella? That's embarrassment. Welcome to headquarters, embarrassment. I wanted to talk to you, though, about uh, this movie because this is your first, what, feature film in like 12 years, I want to say? This is, yeah, my first theatrical release. Or, my, yeah, my first theatrical feature release. What was that experience like and how impactful was it it being Inside Out too? Because I know you worked on the first one. So that... mm -hmm. Yeah, I've worked on on many films in different capacities. So it it was an easy change over for me. And especially having worked on TV for years, um, it was stepping into very comfortable shoes. Um, you, you get some pretty amazing skills working quickly and succinctly when you're working on a weekly TV show. It's what is the most important? What, uh, what can we get the most emotional impact from what is important to you as far as the storytelling specificity and let everything go everything else go and when you transfer that to this feature medium it's a wonderful not, not leisurely pace I would not say that but <laughs> um, the amount of subtlety that I was able to to spend time playing with that was wonderful because it got it it allowed me to be very nuanced in different ways that that I had a lot of fun with because then you create this huge library of things that you you can play with in different ways. I'm sure having a little bit more time allowed you to get a lot more creative as opposed to mm -hmm. right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. and the um the wind up for it also, um, I like to spend some time just playing with my themes beforehand seeing what they can do in different ways when you uh, when you throw them in different contexts like oh that actually works as a small snippet here and I can take that and flip it on its side I wanted to talk about you like crafting those themes right because you're you're coming in to Inside Out 2 we know that Michael Chikino did the first film mm -hmm. uh was it hard like trying to find that balance of maintaining what he already created and like that that signature sound of the first film while also mm -hmm. like infusing your own voice into it was that a challenge for you no <laughs> end of question I'm sorry I'm just kidding no it was I had the best experience with this Michael is primarily a storyteller that is his first priority so in this it was use that original theme use that original style where is appropriate for the story. And then everywhere else, look at it from a fresh perspective. Um, I'm, we've collaborated a lot. He, he understands my instincts and style very well, as do I. So he had a lot of trust and, and he was excited to, to figure out and hear where I would go with it. Um, I think you put on this sort of musical suit when you decide to go into any world and you walk around in that. So I, I put on some of that, but the landscape has changed in Riley. So it didn't require me to just stay there. Um, I was encouraged to, and, and found inspiration immediately to go, okay, Riley's on the ice and could get chucked around and like, <laughs> and smacked around like hockey's scary. Um, so, so getting a very visceral sound there and then figuring out what that meant as far as, you know, scoring with heavy drums and then getting really specific to each hit. So you really felt like she might trip over herself. Um, but then also there was a lot of fertile uh, story ground for new themes that where I couldn't have used the original theme there or if I did it would have lost its impact for where it really deserved to be which for me that became evident that it it was really it is the theme for for Joy and Riley together like that connection when Joy is in control in the joyiest joy <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that things have changed like Riley is older and she has new emotions right so like was it how much fun was it I guess like crafting new themes around like anxiety and these new characters that are introduced and how that kind of changes things. Mm -hmm. One internal character really is, is Riley. It's 
the sense of self. It's Riley's sense of self and her core beliefs. And that was the first one that felt very important to me, very tender. And, and um, like it, it had an ability to go everywhere. Um, that sense of self, which then you get this sort of core theme it's da 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 or in its major view or and then the sense that the sense of self is made up out of core beliefs so having that broken down also into the core beliefs theme which when you listen to it you get this succinct thing but then it when you listen to the core beliefs theme it's da 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 it is that Da, 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 da. It's each part of it in these different ways. Um, and then that can be used throughout the film in an evolutionary way as her core beliefs are getting all messed with down there um, and getting infused with, for better or worse, all the parts of her. But that motif still carries through each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's in these different broken down forms. And then for each one of the, oh, each one of the new emotions, I really wanted to be like a feeling feeling I, I grew up dancing not well, but, but it was it was a part of my my early musical uh, education. So when I'm I'm writing it, Oftentimes, if I'm stuck, I really think like, all right, what does this, this scene feel like? What does this emotion feel like? So one like Ennui was actually difficult because Ennui feels like, I don't, I don't care. I don't want to. So it's like, <laughs> I really had to push myself to do that one. But anxiety felt like it told me like what it is. It was being something that zaps you, like get your attention. And then keep your attention, right? Like like a tap on the shoulder in different ways. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and then um, sort of sweet talking you into believing it again and again and again in all these different ways. So, hey, <laughs> hey. And that, that um, became very versatile as anxiety does, right? It comes in all these different forms and it tricks you into to listening to it in diff different ways. Sometimes it's militaristic. Sometimes it's really subtle and in a way that gets sort of harmonized with other things. Um, and it lent itself really well to the, the climax where I got to break it down and just leave that, leave that alarm sense on that repeated note playing over and over and over again. And then I ran that through a bunch of different effects processors. So everything playing there is just that, 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 that. And then that run through all these different things. So it sounds like, be like an electric wire fizzing out or echoing on itself. It has, it, it's very haunting. And then you get the inside vulnerable statement of what anxiety is really trying to say on this plucked piano. Bum, ba, da, bum, ba, da. In this way where you just, oh my gosh, I can tell how much she cares and how she's just lost it. <laughs> yeah, it's very effective because I felt myself watching this movie and I felt my heart racing. And then I felt it like slowing down as the music and the scene kind of winds down. It's it was intense, and so it was very effective. It was difficult, yeah, to watch that. I, I at one point thought about asking them to send me a cut without the, without watching Riley smack herself in the head, because it was just oh, heartbreaking. It's like oh, honey, no. and the heartbeat speeding up. It just, it did, it did cause a lot. <laughs> I almost felt like I myself was having a panic attack. That's how effective it was, but. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> because I did while I was writing it. <laughs> it's like, just just like a good old two day long one, you know. <laughs> so that that translated, but I also felt like I had a great responsibility within that 
that they could tell me that it was too intense, but that I had to start with it being very authentic. Yeah. And, and I, I was, I was, um, I wasn't thinking about it intellectually at that point in the way that I just described it as being broken down. It was just like, no, it just feels like this. <laughs> We can get all intellectual about the things we got anxious about earlier or later, but in the time when you are frozen like that, it is just that message coming through that is totally distorted and you, you're you frozen. I wanted to talk to you about like the different types of music that you use in this film, right? We, of course, we have the orchestral themes that you use, but we also have like a lot of like alt punk, alt rock and punk in this film as well. Uh, what was it like, like just crafting the sound around all of that, because you had a lot of different tools at your disposal. And mm-hmm. it made inside of Riley's mind and outside of Riley's mind feel very distinct. Mm-hmm. I needed there to feel like a sense of physical stakes out there. Hockey's like, that's intense. <laughs> that's, uh, so while I was thinking of first how to do it, and, and when I first watched the film, the director, said, we want this to smash in on Pixar. Like, this is what you were expecting. This, you know, you, you've got this lovely theme and, oh, we're going back to Riley's world and what is going on? Wait, what? <laughs> so uh, getting that smash into a, a hard guitar solo, it's like, we're going somewhere else right now. Um, it's it, the, the setting has changed. Um, and as I was considering how to do this, um, I, I went out roller skating last summer to this uh, monthly park skate in Burbank. Uh, they they do a themed one. It was Barbie versus barb, barbed wire. <laughs> Thriller all dressed up, and it's, it's so funny. And the DJ was awesome. And as I was there skating, and I hadn't in years, I'm trying to not fall over myself, and the DJ's playing stuff that makes me remember roller derby not that I've spent time playing it a lot myself but I have watched a lot of it and I've got cousins that that are awesome at it and that is that's some spin out and hurt yourself stuff and the way that it made my body feel as I was going around and around was like this feels like you're flying especially when you get those rockabilly drums going so I got very specific on how I wanted the drum hits to work. As it, there's that uh, term with uh, when you're scoring something and you get really specific mimicking um, ha- what the action looks like on the screen called Mickey Mousing. And Carl Stalling did a lot of that in, in Looney Tunes, like hitting things very specifically. And I, I had some real fun with, with doing that on this score. Um, but I did it in that first scene with with the drums quite a bit, where when I was writing it in the demo, I got very specific with where each hit was gonna go. So it felt like she might trip over herself when the drums come to a (laughs) sort of thing. And then uh, showed the drummer the the film. I said, that scene, I said, all right, so that plus amp it up. lose control even more, swing it out more. So it really feels like she might crash into the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the whole the whole thing made it feel like there was a sense of stakes, but there was also a sense of posturing, certain like, like pump up, like amp up music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it's very, again, like it's, it's very effective because like you said, that opening moments, it hits you right away and I think it does help recontextualize the film a lot where it's like, yeah, Riley is becoming a different person than when we last saw her. And it's very evident in the score, but also, again, once we retreat back into, into her mind, we see demolition and like new emotions co- show up and it's like, okay, we hit the ground running. I can't wait to see where this goes. Yeah. I'm um, glad. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so again, with like the, alt rock and punk influences did you think about like what would Riley's favorite band possibly oh yeah yeah I was definitely I was definitely doing that and 
already like I love film scores. I love listening to film scores, but I listen to a lot of different music. I, I don't. Um, my my playlist is not all classical and it's not all any one thing. Um, and so I was thinking, well, she probably loves some Olivia Rodrigo. Maybe maybe not right at that point since uh, uh, Get Up and Glow is is her favorite band right at the beginning. Maybe that's maybe that's a little more um, girl group. Uh, I'm gonna date myself too much if I say the girl groups I think of. But um, I was thinking about Olivia Rodrigo and um, and Taylor Swift and some of those. I've got a 14 year old niece and I was just checking in along with her the whole time. going like, what do you like right now? What's up? That's actually very smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, she'd answer me like on Wii. She'd go like, I don't know. It's fine. All music's good. I don't care. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Helpful. <laughs> well, it's worth, you can't go wrong with Taylor Swift and Olivia Rodriguez. I, you, know, that's... <laughs> you know what I got a lot out of that, though, was the great mixing techniques that are in there. That uh, Getting that really broad bass sound. It just feels like it brings it, it, in the, and high highs, like bright high end which just feels like it makes so much room for an emotional experience in the middle. I did want to talk to you because I, I know I'm going to let you go in, in a few. I wanted to ask you about you working with Pixar, right? And becoming the first uh, woman to score a Pixar feature film. Did you feel the pressure of that or was it just another day at the office? For you? What's wonderful is I, d I hadn't even thought about it when it was, when it, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky for that, but, um, I guess I didn't feel the pressure of it in the, what I always think is you want the right person for the job. And I felt uniquely qualified for this job, having worked on the first film, having worked so much with Pixar, I felt really connected with Kelsey. Like we were, had a really good pairing and that we were going to, we were going to do something together that he would be really happy with. And I felt like I, I could uh, help translate that. So that was priority to me. If I didn't feel like there was a good connection with Kelsey, I'd be like, I'm not the right person for it. Um, but it did end up feeling, it, it ends up meaning a lot to me in the end. Um, because, because like I said, you want the right person for the job. And the more diversity that we can have in who is telling stories and who, like the more people that will be inspired to, to think that they can come into this field and, and feel good, like feel like it's not just a, a push through, like if I can represent hard work that looks like this way, hard work and fun that looks like one way and it inspires somebody to come in, that makes me really happy. I didn't um, I didn't take myself uh, seriously as a composer uh, when I was young at all. I didn't maybe it was maybe it was the small town thing, but there wasn't a lot of models for me um, and it wasn't until I got into college and I hadn't thought I was going to be a composer. And um, I thought I was going in for piano major and turned out I was not that great at piano. My technique stunk because I was going to practice and, um, and writing. <laughs> and I just hadn't given myself credit for that. So as soon as I was there in college and they said, um, they in a composition class, they said, well, you're in the major, right? Because clearly you are a composer and you write a lot. It's like, oh, oh. So I, I think that the more the more voices and and experiences that we can bring to this, the more people we can inspire, and then we will get better and better stories. I will say, Andrea, you are an inspiration. I mean, you just scored a billion dollars double. <laughs> so, I mean, that is 
impressed of, to say the least. And uh, unexpected. Yeah. That that's you know that's you're just hoping <laughs> that you're able to uh, to make somebody connect with something, and then for it to to do well like this is unexpected and inspiring because it can be so easy to get pulled into the fear of everything going on with headlines um, all the time. And the, the message in this movie is really one that represents the good, you know, the, the good guys, the, <laughs> the, and the good guys is just compassion for ourselves. Right. And, and a, a positive communication and po- you know healthy self-development and I feel like the good one, like to have those headlines to me is is a a way of telling the world positivity and um, good storytelling. Supporting artists can win, and it's worth investing our time and money in, which is really important too for a company like. Pixar, who is incredible at how they support their artists. Disney and Pixar do it like not a lot do. And and for them to have this positive experience, I think is a great inspiration for, hopefully a great inspiration for for models, for more companies and and storytellers. For sure. I will say this is easily my favorite movie of the year so far. Oh, cool. Mission accomplished. Uh, I've had you for almost 23 minutes now, so I'm going to let you go.